the Honorable Member for Selkirk Interlake. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to rise in support of Canada's continued military contribution to the mission in Libya. As I, I want to add my voice to uh, all the thank yous that have gone out in recognition to the great work that's been done by members of the Canadian Armed Forces uh, over in uh, the Libya mission. I also have to really give uh, a lot of uh, credos to our diplomats, especially Ambassador Sandra uh, McArdle. Uh, she has done just a fantastic job in re-establishing our embassy there, getting the mission working on a temporary basis while they do repairs to the, to the embassy building, and uh, really leading uh, the Canadian charge on the diplomatic end. And I have to thank all the uh, humanitarian relief agencies that are at uh, work in uh, Libya, uh, providing the resources and the services so desperately needed by the people after their civil war, uh, that, which is still underway as, as we speak. And of course, I want to also thank all the uh, department personnel with the um, National, Department of National Defense, uh, Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and International Trade, and the Canadian International Development Agency, who provided briefings to us as members of Parliament and, and specifically to, to those of us that are members of the National Defense Committee on keeping us abreast of everything that was happening uh, throughout the summer and into this fall and how the Canadian uh, military mission was playing out and also how things were happening from the standpoint of, of, of relief and also uh, making sure that there was that uh, diplomatic uh, briefings so we know how the relationship was progressing with the National Transitional Council. So I do want to extend my uh, thanks and appreciation on behalf of my constituents and indeed on behalf of my committee for, for those briefings. Now this mission began last March in response to events in Libya that caused most observers by surprise. At the beginning of this year, Few could have accurately predicted that the Libyan people would rise up in protest against decades of oppression under the Gaddafi regime. Just as few could have foreseen similar uprisings against entrenched dictators that occurred a bit earlier in Tunisia and Egypt. The Libyan situation illustrates just how unpredictable the global security environment has become. It also illustrates that responsible governments must be ready to respond to events as they unfold, at home and abroad, this government must remain ready to protect its citizens against all threats while also assuming leadership positions in promoting security and justice around the world. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, Libya is but the most recent example demonstrating why maintaining military capabilities and a high level of readiness makes sense. And as the Minister said earlier, the Libyan population will not have the opportunity it has now without the Canadian Armed Forces contribution to ongoing international efforts in Libya. Both the scale of our contribution and the speed at which it was deployed took a tremendous amount of effort and expertise. The government acted decisively in support of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1973. We deployed CF-18 fighter aircraft to Sicily one day after Resolution uh, 1973 passed to join our allies and partners in enforcing the arms embargo and no-fly zone over Libya. And almost three weeks earlier, HMCS Charlottetown set sail for the Mediterranean in early March to join Allied ships in view of Libya's deteriorating security situation. In both cases, the men and women of the Canadian Armed Services deployed quickly and professionally with very little notice and ba began contributing immediately to what would soon become the NATO-led mission, Operation Unified Protector. A NATO mission led by a Canadian general, no less, Lieutenant General Charles Bouchard, someone who I am familiar with as he was stationed at 17 Wing and No. 1 Air Command Headquarters in Winnipeg. This rapid, effective response is a testament to the high level of our Canadian Armed Forces training, readiness, and equipment. Today, Canada maintains one of the international community's more robust military contributions to the mission. This includes the Royal Canadian Navy's HMCS Vancouver, together with its Embark Sea King helicopter. Just as HMCS Charlottetown did before it was relieved last month, the Vancouver escorting, is escorting mine countering measuring vessels and replenishment ships to ensure that the Libyan waters remain navigable and that humanitarian supplies make it to shore. HMCS Vancouver is also patrolling Libyan waters to ensure that illicit persons and material do not enter or leave Libya. And in the skies, the Royal Canadian Air Force is demonstrating leadership through Task Force uh, Libichio. 
Our two CP-140 Aurora Maritime Patrol aircrafts are contributing to surveillance and intelligent efforts. Our seven CF-18 Hornet jet fighters have, to date, conducted over 800 sorties along with the United Kingdom and France, are the most active fighters of any allied or partner air force. And our two C-130 Hercules and one CC-150 Polaris aerial refueling aircraft are taking part in one, one NATO spokesperson has called the greatest air-to-air -air refueling effort in the history of modern aerial warfare. Mr. Speaker, each of these Canadian Armed Forces operations are critical. It is clear that along with the contributions of our allies and partners, they've achieved significant progress in wearing down what are now the remnants of the Gaddafi regime's ability to attack civilian Libyans. And these efforts have allowed the Transitional National Council the time and space to establish greater control, which will all but eliminate further attacks but what remains of Gaddafi's forces. Earlier uh, this fall, the Prime Minister addressed our members of the Canadian Armed Services in Trapani, Italy. And I'd like to quote him. And he said, because you held the ring while Libyans fought their own fight with their oppressor, the Libyan people are now free to choose. This is the best of Canada's military tradition. For we are not a country that makes war for gain or for territory. We do not fight for glory. And if we covet honor, it's only a reputation for doing the right thing in a good cause. That is all, and that is enough." End quote. Mr. Speaker, I believe that Canadians can be proud of our country's leadership role from day one in responding to the Libyan crisis. But what is truly imp is impressive is that while all this was going on, the Canadian Armed Forces were carrying out other international operations, as well as operations here at home, in North America. Here in Canada, the Canadian Armed Forces continue to provide critical search and rescue capabilities, providing life-saving assistance to those in distress anywhere in Canada and at any time. This was demonstrated rather vividly just last month when our military personnel responded quickly and professionally when a civilian airliner tragically crashed near Resolute Bay, Nunavut. And just over the past few months, our men and women in uniform have assisted our provincial authorities in Saskatchewan Ontario, Quebec, and in my home province of Manitoba, and indeed in my very own riding, in dealing with and preparing for floods and forest fires. In North America, the Canadian Armed Forces continues to work with their American counterparts, mainly through NORAD, to defend the skies above the continent. But while the Canadian Armed Forces have been busy at home over the past several months, they were also engaged in truly massive undertakings in Afghanistan. In July, the Canadian Armed Forces wound down five years of combat operations in Afghanistan and shifted their focus to the training of Afghan security forces. The Canadian Armed Forces are involved in 15 other missions around the world, fulfilling a variety of roles in addition to their operations in Afghanistan and Libya. All of these missions are essential. Nous ne pouvons tout simplement pas nous permettre de les interrompre. We simply can't afford to not do them just as we cannot, as the Minister stated, afford to leave Libya now. Mr. Speaker, I support Canada's continued military commitment to this NATO mission and to the people of Libya. And I call on all members of this House to continue its support for strengthening and sustaining the Canadian Armed Forces' impressive readiness and capabilities well into the future. Thank you. Questions or comments?